Good morning. Uh, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Steve Rich, who's been a geriatrician in the system for almost three decades at this point. Yeah. Um, we won't count beyond that. <laughs> um, Steve will be discussing dementia after amyloid, the case for the cholinergic hypothesis. Steve? Good morning. Um, this is probably my favorite introductory slide because it kind of gets, whoops, I don't think you can hear me. Can you hear me now? This will be a race between the PowerPoint and losing my voice this morning. So um, we'll see which wins. Um, so um, the reason it entitled this um, Dementia After Amyloid is you can't open the paper without hearing about something, a drug failing, um, something else not working in Alzheimer's disease, and it pretty much characterizes um, the biomedical news these days. So um, I think we're at a turning point in how we think about Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general. And it is a bit of a turning point where we really don't know where it's going. But, um, I'm, and I'm gonna represent one point of view on that. But, so financial disclosures, I actually am a managing member of Com Pharm I, Com Pharmaceuticals, which holds intellectual property and makes absolutely no money. So I'm not sure it's a financial interest to keep losing money. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of other money I've lost on this. So if you've trained at all in the last 30 years, I don't have to tell you about this. This is gospel. This is the gospel according to amyloid. Um, you see that um, what we know is that the theory is that at some point, here we are, a bunch of non-demented people sitting in, sitting in the Twig Auditorium, and then at some point, our amyloid starts to rise. At some point, it makes neurofibrillary tangles, and we start losing our neuronal um, integrity. And it's usually occurring at a time long before symptoms. And as this continues, it goes on to the ultimate end that we end up going into healthcare administration. <laughs> Applause. <laughs> um, the, um, so this, this has just dominated all our teaching. And, and it should, it's a wonderful idea because when you look at it, it's so clean. You've got, you produce amyloid, cells do that, you, got, you cut the amyloid in a couple places by little enzymes, and this floats around and causes your problem. And in addition, it's so clean that the amyloid precursor protein, which gives us more of this, and these two enzymes, the genes are the best recognized genetic signals for early onset Alzheimer's disease. So how does it get better than that? And you know, so you've got these great targets that you can launch pharmacologic attacks on. The tau hypothesis, which has been running behind that, but kind of go in parallel, says that tau, a small uh, protein that stabilizes the microtubular networks of neurons, gets phosphorylated and then forms hel helical, filament, helical el filaments, which then get into the neurofibrillary tangles, which we all know characterizes amyloid. So this all fits together perfectly. And um, this has actually been represented in the pharmacolo pharmacologic approaches to this. Um, uh, this is a little, very tiny writing, but look at the red dots on here, if you're not colorblind like me. And what you'll find is that a real, uh, the amyloid hypothesis has really dominated, especially when you get down into the phase three drugs right here. So if this were true, and this nice thing, it should be a perfect world, except 99.9% .9 of all drugs tried in Alzheimer's have failed. And the, the implications of that are now becoming huge. Um, if we look at this, it really kind of hit the fan in 2018. And if we look at Pfizer, for example, just fired 300 scientists and said, we're out of this. And everybody says, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible. But they're, they're a drug company. And their logic is we have not returned any equity to investors going down this route. And the same thing happened with Novartis and many other people. Matter of fact, Wall Street completely turned against um, the 
uh, pharmacologic companies that were invested. And this was a company that used to be called Accident Dementia Solutions, okay? It changed its name to Accident Gene Therapy to get the hell out of Dodge. I mean, they didn't want to do this. And I was actually working, this company was helping to develop a drug I was working on, and um, you can see what happened. And this actually looks better because there was a three to one reverse split. So divide that by three, that's how bad it is. And there are probably some people in the audience who may have actually invested in that company or your, or your 401k did. So this type of logic, and the CEO of Accident told me, he said, the street hates dementia, the street hates us, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and that's an attitude that has happened. So there's been a lot less investment now in looking at um, you know, getting at the core of dementing diseases. So what's left? If, we, if amyloid didn't work, what else do we have? Take that out, and amyloid has been sucking the oxygen out of the room. Everything goes in amyloid. Um, we talk about neuroinflammation is another category where people actually are interested in terms of the inflammatory. To date, not a lot has really come to yield on that, but tau, as I mentioned, is getting much more focused as we now find that the tau deposits in the brain correlate with regional symptoms more than the amyloid did. But to date, all tau-based therapies, and recently there was one for progressive supranuclear palsy, have failed. Um, Insulin resistance is another area people are looking at. The idea that there is decreased glucose utilization in the brain, in the demented brain, also in the delirious brain. Um, and the idea that can you actually improve that utilization? And by central, people are looking at things such as central nervous system acting um, drugs, many of the oral drugs we have. Vascular disease has always been a, um, an interesting thing because that the same risk factors for vascular disease correlate with risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. As a matter of fact, the, for late onset Alzheimer's disease, the number one genetic factor is APOE4. It's, a, it's an apoprotein which combines with lipids to make a lipoprotein. So we're talking about a lipoprotein as the best predictor we have. So the idea that there's an interaction between vascular and um, neurodegenerative processes is very intriguing. We haven't exactly found it yet. There's protein clearance, which is a relatively new idea that there's impaired, which we'll talk about. So there's impaired clearance of pathologic proteins and other um, substances in the brain. And then way at the bottom of the totem pole is this idea called the cholinergic hypothesis. Uh, we'll spend a little time on that. So let's look at all the drugs we have to treat Alzheimer's disease as we sit here right now. Tacrin came out in 1993. Dinepazil came out in 1996. Galantamine 2001, Rivastigmine a little before that, and we have Mamantine in 2003. That's it, folks. <laughs> There's nothing else. We haven't had a new drug to treat Alzheimer's disease in 17 years. And we'll talk about why that happens. So eight, and 80% of these drugs just happen to be cholinesterase inhibitors. Oops. Um, so what does that tell us? 80% of our effective drugs are cholinesterase inhibitors for Alzheimer's disease. Now, the cholinergic hypothesis, um, which many of you haven't heard about because you've been educated during the amyloid hypo uh, hypothesis. Now, this has been around for a long time. Um, we said studies that scopolamine was actually could mimic the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in animals. This is a long time ago. How long? I was a high school football player when that came out, okay? <laughs> With no gray hair. So that's a long time ago. So um, support for that came out when really they found that, col that cholinergic nerves were depleted in the brain in Alzheimer's patients. That's a long time ago. I was a fuzzy freshman in college at that time with no gray hair. And um, so this, again, this is going back there. there. And in 19, um, the actual hypothesis that acetylcholine was causing a significant problem um, was actually in 1982. And thank God there are no pictures of me in 1982, but I will tell you that the popular song at the time was Ebony and Ivory by Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. So if that sets you back at just how far ago that was. Um, and if it weren't for the total domination of the idea 
that amyloid was the sole cause of Alzheimer's disease, we would probably be a decade ahead in our progress on this, but we're not. And we'll explain a little bit about that. Now, the amyloid hypothesis really became so dominant. I actually talked to people in the drug industry who say they remember the day they, were, they had their labs, they were doing this, and they remember the day that somebody said, put all that aside, amyloid's the cause of, of Alzheimer's disease, we don't have to look at anything else. And it just dominated. So it became, as, as the statement here, that it became the hypothesis, it actually affected people who got funding all the way from the NIH to fill in throw up topic grants, it affected getting tenure, it just took over. Um, now, here's the patent for Dinepazil, Aricept. 1990. So at this point, we actually had a drug, probably arguably our best drug, um, as some people say, definitely the most popular drug, was in 1990. Now, at the same time, this was competing with the amyloid hypothesis. Now, the amyloid hypothesis obviously starts with Dr. Alzheimer, and, uh, you know, and he actually found these plaques and tangles in a 51-year-old woman who died of pre what he called pre-senile dementia. In 1984, people actually determined that the, the uh, protein sequence of beta amyloid that was found in the plaques. Now, that's a long time ago, too. And Dr. Sham, what were you doing in 1984? You were spinning urines on the seventh floor of Strong in your penny loafers at 2 in the morning, right? Yes. You still wearing the penny loafers? I, I think. Where do you get those? I think they stopped making them. Anyway, yes, Ron, and, and Ann Falsey was, our R2, was an R2, so, and neither Ann or I had gray hair. Um, so this is a long time ago. And um, in 1991, around the same time Aricep started coming out, the discovery of the APP mutation, which is the mutation in the gene that makes the amyloid precursor protein, came out. And this was the most cited biomedical article of that entire year. So this shows you how this hypothesis just kind of took the place by storm. Now, people are looking back at this, and I like this, amyloid partisans permeated drug companies, journals, the NIH, and decided what should be funded. Things shifted from a scientific inquiry to a religious belief system, and people were uh, stopped, for, where people stopped being even skeptical. This reminds me of a, state, um, a term from Dr. Stearns, beware of eminence-based medicine. This is the classic example of eminence-based medicine. Everybody jumped onto the bandwagon and, and everybody else got run over. Um, so what about acetylcholine? Is there, um, what is the case for acetylcholine? There are animal studies which support the role that acetylcholine is not just a symptom, the drop in acetylcholine is not necessarily a symptom of this disease, but actually potentially a cause. There's human studies and observations, and there's also experimental support for this. Now, let's kill some animals. Okay, here's a cute little bunny. <laughs> okay, if you take, and this was done again back in, in 2000s, right, when the amyloid hypothesis was rising, cholinergic hypothesis was being kicked to the curb. Um, we take this cute little bunny and we do an immunoselective lesion. We take out the cholinergic nerves in his brain. And if you follow, what happens is he develops amyloid in his brain. Okay, that's pretty interesting. But what happens if you take that animal, that um, bunny, and you give him a cholinesterase inhibitor? Same bunny, same lesion. What happens is he doesn't get amyloid in his brain. And what happens if you let the, the cholinergic nerves grow back because you didn't take them all out? The amyloid goes away. You'd think you'd kind of have a closed loop there. But again, this was drowned out. This is the work by Tom Beach at the Banner Institute. Um, so bunnies are cute, so let's kill some rats. Um, if we take a rat and we actually section the basal cholinergic nerves in the basal forebrain, the nucleus basalis of Maynard. And then we do something nasty to them by giving them a stroke with like standard microspheres. What happens is they get a poor outcome. But if we take the same group down here and leave their cholinergic nerves intact, they actually get the better outcome. So this raises a possibility that acetylcholine is involved in the neuroplasticity of recovery from stroke and many other diseases. 
Let's go back and get some more rabbits. Um, if you actually take these rabbits um, and the, you give them muscarinic agonists, you activate those muscarinic receptors, and again, this is done by Tom Beach back at the, um, in around 2000, 2001, um, you can reduce the beta amyloid in their brain. Point, point is that everybody has beta amyloid in their brain. Animals have beta amyloid in their brain. It's a natural part of our brains. It sometimes increases in responses to infections and trauma and everything else. But you could reduce it here versus not doing anything. So we, you'd think that this would make a lot of sense at the time, but again, it was drowned out. One of the things I think that's interesting and underappreciated is that we think of acetylcholine in terms of our classic, you know, first year biology synapse, you know, it's going to jump this gap and activate the other side, and that's all it does, and then it goes away. And the truth is that if you look at the brain, most acetylcholine is not released into a synapse. It's actually released into the interstitium of the brain. So what does it do there? We don't know. And it may actually be a paracrine effect, a local hormone that does other things. When I learned this, I usually re, um, reflect back on one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Edison is, every once in a while you see something and you I say, we realize we don't know one millionth of a percent about anything. And um, I think it's very humbling, but I think I always keep this in the back of my mind. Now, so what else is happening? Now there's also, let's, let's kill some more rats. Um, now, what happens is that we've always had this dilemma the human brain uses 30% of our energy at any time, but it doesn't have a lymphatic system. It's a very highly metabolic organism, but it has less lymphatics than Ron Sham's big toe in, stuffed inside that penny loafer. So, um, so how does that actually function? And so back in around 19, 2012, on the other side of 490, um, Jeff Illiff was drilling holes in the skulls of rats and putting in things so you could actually observe. And this is where the idea of a glymphatic system came in. The idea that glymph, cell, specifically the foot processes of oligodendrocytes, actually formed channels that allowed for the high flow of fluid through the brain. And he could show functionally that this was responsible for significant brain fluid turnover that was compatible with the amount of metabolism that was going on. So this was, this was just not that long ago. Now, on an ultra uh, uh, Jeff proposed that mechanism, but in England, um, another friend of mine was working on the idea that there actually are channels within the walls of the artery, uh, which have been named, I love this term, IPAD, Intramural Periarterial Drainage System, and that she actually, Roxanne Carrari could actually show that there's actually, I'm supposed to use this thing, okay, that there's actually drainage of amyloid th and other proteins through these cells. Again, Jeff discovered the function. I think Roxanne has discovered actually the structure of how it happens. The, the other thing that actually Roxanne's postgrad, postdoc showed was this was dependent upon the contraction of smooth muscles within the wall of the artery. And those, what she also found was those were cholinergic nerves. So we have now a hypothesis by which protein turn turnover in the brain may be dependent upon the degree of acetylcholine neurotransmission in the brain. Intriguing. Now, if we, it leads us to a hypothesis that maybe the proteins that we're finding in the brain are just symptoms of something else that's wrong. That amyloid does accumulate in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, but it isn't the cause of Alzheimer's disease. It's a marker of something else going wrong. And you could uh, hypothesize that if I put my little green sustainability arrow over there, meaning this is actually what keeps, us, keeps the brain clean. If this is impaired, you could actually imagine that alpha-synuclein accumulates. You get Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, and multi-system atrophy. And beta amyloid associated with Amyloid, angi um, amyloid angiopathy and Alzheimer's disease and tau could be associated with the frontal temporal dementias, progressive superior palsy. Um, actually, make, make a Nettergaard, who is actually the lab that Jeff Elliff worked in, has actually come out and said, essentially all neurodegenerative diseases are associated with the misaccumulation of cellular waste. Now, she said associated, and I think that's an important term. 
This is an association. We don't know cause and effect. And outside of, to my knowledge, alpha synuclein is one of the few that you could actually show is pathologic. Um, the other ones, you know, the tau and everything, you can't really transmit them back and forth. But um, so they're associated. Now, is there any human data that supports this? And you really have to dig for this. But we know that the central nervous system has a certain amount of cholinergic nerves, and they decline with age. And that decline starts around age 40. And at age 40, we find we can't multitask as well. We don't, we don't have as much you know, random access memory to do things. And we find it very hard to learn how to use an EHR. <laughs> Now, it is supplanted by something we call wisdom, and we haven't really quantitated wisdom yet, and people are actually trying to do this. But how do you quantitate wisdom? As some people say it's you know, experience with emotion and everything else. So while we lose the ability to learn the EHR, we have the wisdom to say, why the hell did we ever decide that bedside care in Rochester should be decided by a software engineer in Wisconsin? So um, that's the wisdom to say, why did we do this? which hopefully will prevail. Um, anyway, um, if we look at neurodegenerative diseases, all these diseases we talk about have a reduction in acetylcholine neurotransmission. Um, dementia with Lewy bodies has the lowest level of acetylcholine in any disease we know. Um, we also find that if you manipulate the human cholinergic system, you can actually cause changes not only in function, but in morphology. For, this is one of numerous studies that have come out. This is one of the first one in 2015, which showed that people on anticholinergic medication, and in this case, especially urinary incontinence medication, because you take it every day, and, and, and you know, in elderly patients, it not only causes an impairment, it increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And there, there are several, several studies now going back, now that we have computerized drug databases and you can make these correlations. So, we also found that if we treat people with acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, the people who respond right away, you know, show some, are actually going to live longer than people who don't. And um, we also know that if you, go, if you go back to old studies, which have done CTs and MRIs and various other things, and now apply modern techniques with computerized volumetric techniques, you actually find that the, the brain, atrophy in the brain is less if you're on a cholinesterase inhibitor. The other thing is that if you inhibit, and I'll explain a little bit about this later, there are two ways of getting rid of acetylcholine, probably more, but the two main ones are acetylcholinesterase and butylcholinesterase. And um, if you inhibit both of them, you get a better effect and at, um, in, at a two-year trial in Alzheimer's disease than if you inhibit one. Also, butyl, I'll mention also butylcholinesterase polymorphisms are also associated with your risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. So, this is where we need a prop. That's, that's a prop. I figure if Marvin Grief can wear a cowboy hat during the Father Norton Award, I can wear this. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you why. Increasing idea is the idea of cognitive reserve. The idea that we have a certain amount of capacity for cognition po possibly reflected actually in our, um, the amount of acetylcholine in nerves. What supports that? People have heard of the nun study? Yeah. The nun study was a group of Carmelite nuns who, for those people who didn't have to go to Catholic school, you're really lucky. Um, the, for, um, for the people who know about Carmelite nuns, they're sequestered. They stay in the same place until you know, until they pass away and uh, don't interact with the outside world. So somebody went back and looked at their autobiographical essays they had to write when they first came in the order. And with neurolinguistics, actually you can assess a person's intelligence by the way they write. And what they found was a huge correlation between the intelligence when you're an 18-year-old novitiate and your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And the more intelligent you were, the lower the risk. And these people were you know, a closed, you know, nested case control study in a group of 70 people staying in the same place. So uh, there's a book on that called Aging with Grace, which is worth a read. There's also some evidence, especially in developmental disabilities, that the cholinergic system is actually proportional to intelligence. And um, when you see people who are impaired, 
is there, they've lost some of this cognitive reserve. The, the fact that the, um, the best thing you can possibly do to prevent Alzheimer's disease is to be in this room, because obviously you've all achieved something academically, and academic achievement has been associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And this is across many studies. Now people are going back and mining all those stupid tests we took as baby boomers in like elementary school, and people are find, digging up that data and, and making the same correlations now in Scotland and in here. And um, there was recently a paper that showed that actually your APOE4 status, I mentioned that's the biggest risk factor, actually is associated with your adolescent intelligence. So there's several ways in which this seems to be coming back. Now, we also know that people who have developmental disorders have a low cholinergic reserve. We all know about, we, many of us know that people with trisomy 21, Down syndrome, have about a 100% risk by 50 of having Alzheimer's type pathology, amyloid in the brain. And, but only 50% of them actually get Alzheimer's. But, they also have a low, we always blame this on an extra copy of the amyloid precursor protein on chromosome 21, 23. Um, 21. Um, the, um, I'm thinking 23 and me, um, but chromosome 21. Um, but it may actually be the failure of their cholinergic system to clear some of this stuff. Um, we know that susceptibility to scopolamine and this is a test by another colleague of mine, Peter Snyder, who um, has actually done a, what's called a scopolamine challenge test. You can actually give scopolamine to a computerized test. And the people who are more impaired develop Alzheimer's, develop amyloid in their brain, presumably as a marker for impaired clearance. The, um, and genetic variations in these elimination proteins. So the obvious question comes up, why the hat? Okay? And the reason is another risk factor and a negative risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is the size of your head across every study. Now, it seems too simple, bigger brain, less risk, but it keeps showing up in every study. So seven and three quarters, eat your heart out. Um, <laughs> um, so as we know, acetylcholine is actually... Um, metabolized by uh, acetylcholinesterase to product, but there's also a butylcholinesterase, um, which is more present in the glial cells of the brain, more present in the periphery of the body. We know that we, all these drugs pretty much equally will uh, actually inhibit that. We actually know only rivastigmine inhibits both of the commonly used drugs. Now, if you want to see this paper, go back to your office and open up the PDR and flip open to the Exelon patch. And when you look at the Exelon patch, you'll see this graph. It's right in there. That's where I took it from. And you'll see that the 17.4 7, milligram patch works much better than the 9.5. So how many people have used the 17.4 milligram patch? Nobody. It wasn't approved. <laughs> well, I had too many side effects. Even though it clearly worked better, it had too many side effects. So it seems that the dose response curve here is stopped on most of these drugs by their side effects. Now, what prevents us from getting the most out of this therapy? We know that when you dose these drugs to the level of tolerance, you're still inhibiting about 30 to 40 percent of the acetylcholinesterase in the brain. And we haven't, I don't know of a study that's actually measured butylcholinesterase. Um, so we're not getting there. So we don't get enough drug into people, and many people have side effects, and we don't treat them at all because they can't tolerate the drug. So what that led to was an idea that if, you, if we know that we inhibit butylcholinesterase and acetylcholinesterase, which normally would make inactive metabolites, but if we inhibit them, we're going to get a whole lot more acetylcholine in the body. And that's really good for your brain. But what's the, the problem is the side effects are largely gastrointestinal, so we get all the side effects. But what if we blocked that and blocked the side effects? And then we could actually use a higher dose of, um, of these drugs and maybe inhibit butyl and acetylcholinesterase to a higher level. And as I mentioned this before, we do believe 
and actually there's a data that you can absolutely stop this drainage system by inhibiting, by wiping out the cholinergic nerves. And um, therefore, potentially eliminating the, the a route of eliminating pathologic proteins. So here's Tony. And um, Tony, I actually invited him to come here today, but um, he, he, his, his wife didn't want to bring him over. Um, so um, anyway, Tony is a guy we treated early on with, by blocking the peripheral effects of acetylcholine using what's called a quaternary ammonium antimuscarinic drug, in his case, glycopyrrolate. And then we were able to bring his dose of rivastigmine up to 39.9 milligrams a day. This is three years. This is the normal, the published normal course of dementia with Lee bodies, which for people having experience, most people don't live more than five, seven years. And it, it's basically fall, their MMSE should fall half a point a month. And um, so I presented this actually at a meeting to which everybody said, wow, you got lucky for three years and stuff like that. So I went back to the meeting and I presented 90 months. I said, that's getting a little bit absurd. Um, he, Tony is still up and around and I have conversations with him. And he always says, Am I, aren't I supposed to be dead? Um, so we actually saw some dramatic things. We actually, now I apologize, this, I took this off a poster at, at an Alzheimer's meeting. Alzheimer's, Lewy body disease has a more variable progression but a faster one than Alzheimer's disease. But when we took a bunch of people, this was a case series of people we treated like this, they all were doing better over time than they should have been doing. And so a rev if we revise the cholinergic hypothesis and say um, accumulations of abnormal proteins may be the result of a, chol of a cholinergic failure, not the reverse. If we talk about high level, if we can inhibit um, cholinesterase inhibitors or find another way to augment acetylcholine neurotransmission in the brain, we may actually have disease modifying effects and there is some data to support that. And we can actually achieve cholinergic reconstitution of the brain by modifying, um, by enhancing the protein transmission and increasing neuroplasticity, whatever that is. We don't, we talk about it, but we really do not know the actual molecular mechanisms of neuroplasticity. So I think the model shifts to this. You have an overflowing toilet. Do you function, do you focus on what's in the bowl or do you focus on the plumbing? Hence, up till now, as a society represented by our drug, our, our drug development interests, we focused on what's in the bowl and not on the plumbing. So I think the, if we're gonna make some progress in the future, I think we have to shift over and start looking at the plumbing, the drainage of, of what's going on here. Um, this is actually, we actually now have a patent actually. Uh, we had a, a patent on using this to try to uh, prevent the progression of disease, but like all other aspects of dementia research, as of 2018, the company that was developing this dropped it. There's no money in, there's no money in dementia. There's no, there's no way to get investment. So we're really in this huge dearth. And we still have amyloid partisans um, occupying a lot of this. When you go to an Alzheimer's meeting, I'd say 90% of all the presentations and poster sessions and everything else are on amyloid, amyloid in the brain. Now, our studies on amyloid um, have been interesting because not only do they not work in proving cognition, they do engage the target. I went to a presentation on a drug called BAN2401 in uh, Chicago by Biogen, and what they showed was they were so proud of how they did the study, and they should have been, um, they made sure everybody had a positive amyloid scan. So they didn't want anybody saying, we well, didn't really have sick people. They did a little study on the end showing that when they gave this drug, their amyloid scans, the PET scans, turned negative. They took the amyloid out of the brain. It just doesn't really do any good. So there's still a lot of partisans out there who are directing research. And it's really hard to get for companies to say, to go to investors, and it's hard for people to get actually funding for this. And that's the other purpose of the hat. I'll be passing this around at the end, so anybody wants to contribute to, to, to research. Um, the, um, now, uh, hot off the press, um, as of New Year's Eve, 
I, I got an email from Southampton, England, and a study we had designed over the lunch table in Chicago actually uh, using transgenic mice. These are mice that are supposed to develop Alzheimer's disease and cerebral amyloid angiopathy by having a, a human APP pro, amyloid precursor protein and a presenilin-1 in them. And what, it's a standard model for those two diseases in mice. And for the first time, treating a mouse with high dose rivastigmine, there's no amyloid in this brain. And so I just learned that last week. So that's our, and it was one mouse. <laughs> we couldn't afford more. Um, so um, we're going back to try to do that. But I think there's enough evidence to say that now after amyloid, we're, we're going to be looking around for finding um, you know, other places to go. The cholinergic hypothesis preceded the amyloid hypothesis in thinking. It's actually yielded most of our drugs that have been effective. There's a lot of data suggesting that it, it does more, and they're the best symptomatic therapy we have. So the idea that you'd be on these drugs anyway if one of these you know, miracle drugs where they're going to be infusing you know, $50,000 worth of antibodies into your body every year, you're still going to have to be on one of these drugs for symptoms. So why don't we just use them to, to our best effect? So with that, I'm going to throw it open to questions if you have any. So the cholinergic system works by increasing lymphatic flow, which clears these uh, abnormal proteins. You can, you can actually see in the work, and both, and the way I'm looking at it, lymphatic is the function. There's some yeah. function that's acting like a lymphatic. And we've yeah. now, since Jeff's work, um, they've actually identified dural lymphatics that this hooks up to, and believe it or not, your interstitial fluid of your brain flows through your cervical lymph nodes. Um, but, so that's the function, and he has shown that if you put amyloid in the brain, you can see it come out. Roxanne Carrari in England has actually, have fluorescein labeled amyloid, and she can show it going through those channels. She can also show alpha-synuclein leaving through those channels. Isn't it true, though, that this Drainage does not occur all day long. It occurs mostly during non-REM sleep. Right. Specifically delta sleep. Absolutely. So is that? A it, 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 it's, a, it's a factor because you see the, in the interaction of sleep. Studies are showing impaired sleep with a higher incidence of neurodegenerative disease. Yeah. Some neurodegenerative diseases like famili fatal familial insomnia, which is a prion, uh, an endogenous prion disease, actually that's their first manifestation is insomnia. And if you look at when people get into sleep, if you look at their sleep architecture, that may be part of this downward cycle, is that the sleep architecture of a person with a neurodegenerative disease is terrible in terms of doing that. And Jeff did show that, and you may also notice that study they did recently on humans, where they actually, I don't know how they did this, but it got people to sleep in an MRI. And they actually, and with some things, they actually looked at some fancy MRI parameters. Because we, at this point, we can't really image these systems well. Um, but they did find that the total flow increased when humans fell asleep and during um, alpha, a delta wave sleep. Delta wave sleep. Um, so the question would be chicken versus the egg. Can we actually improve sleep and, and improve the drain? <laughs> Sleep instead of using cholinergic and, and uh, absolutely. Now, first thing is, can we get people to sleep better? And we, there's a million arg articles out there showing that as a society, we don't value sleep. As medical residents, Ron, I don't think we valued sleep very much because we wanted to spin all those urines for Dr. Morgan. People don't know that interns, <laughs> interns were not allowed to send a urinalysis at Strong. You had to do it yourself. Um, uh, so if we can we do something to actually enhance sleep can we um as a treatment for this the first step is to stop pathologic sleep which we're doing and um and the answer is yes i think there but we don't know the chicken and the egg on that yeah
Yeah, the, yeah the, the question Larry asks is what about, has been recognized that the, uh, they call them prion-like particles because the, pre, the prion, which we know coming in from the outside in mad cow disease and um, other things, is actually um, a misfolded protein that then forms a, um, the form for causing other misfolded proteins in doing that. And we know that certain diseases, such as fatal familial insomnia, the have a, their, their proteins have amino acid substitutions that make it easier to fold. And as our head of infectious disease and I discussed, but she's not paying attention to me, but um, <laughs> um, millennials. Anyway, the, um, no, but actually when we had that thing about the guy, the, the squirrel brain guy, remember the thing about the, the it was all over the internet, a guy eats squirrels and, the, and, uh, and actually Mary Rose had told me that actually that was an in dot. Yeah, we were, we were making fun of you while you were looking at your phone. <laughs> Mary Rose, Mary Rose actually told me that was an endogenous prion. That, that, uh, and, yeah, it wasn't an external prion. So the question is, do these systems, actually, because chances are we're misfolding proteins all the time, is the is this system involved in eliminating misfolded proteins? Are they somehow able to be put out like other byproducts of metabolism? And uh, there isn't a really great answer to that, but that's a hypothesis that in, when these systems are impaired, we may get more of that. We have a system like an amyloid for in a multiple myeloma, you know, we're overwhelming the system. We're just producing too much of these proteins or, or the APP or um, uh, mutations in the APP. I think Ron's question is, you know, we have amyloidosis elsewhere. We've known that for a long time from, you know, as, as primary, secondary, um, associated with different diseases. That amyloid does not correlate with brain amyloid. This, yeah, they, just, they just call it amyloid because it has the appearance of amyloid, but it's nothing, the, the molecular content of that amyloid. It seems to be different. And I, I, I probably can't speak to the molecular structure of that much. But what you see clinically is that people, let's say, with cerebral amylo um, amyloid angiopathy, uh, which um, is probably more common than we think, and we're starting to find it more on MRIs because of, we're doing gradient imaging. But people with that don't have systemic amyloid. And likewise, people with systemic amyloid don't get cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It may be, and we don't. I don't think anybody completely understands that. Um, um, I that's a great question. I don't know actually. Um, because the answer is the, the amyloids that the brain makes is beta amyloid, right? And um, all I think, brain cells make that, so we all make beta absolutely. Amyloid. So the differences that lead to the deposition of the pleated protein has to do more with the clearance than no. with actually making it. Right, and I think Pratt's, Pratt's point is that the amyloid that you see in cerebral amyloid angiopathy is made in the central nervous system. And amyloid by itself doesn't cross over into the central nervous system. And so I don't know the question of the molecular structure. It's a great question. Uh, but we know that the place of production is different. That'd be a great question. I don't know if that's been looked at. But if you had, it's like a CNS lymphoma. Or, or something, we don't know what causes it. We know proteins by themselves naturally can misfold and become their doppelganger. And that doesn't, it probably happens all the time and doesn't lead to pathological processes. It's only when the system gets overwhelmed and you can maybe get enough of this to form a fibril. Because it, for example, like beta amyloid itself doesn't seem to be the problem. It's the fibril of beta amyloid that is, has been associated. We think the same thing, as I said, amyloid 
questionable. I think we have better data for alpha-synuclein in the Parkinson's disorders, where you can actually transmit the fibril over to a rat, and it'll spread. And by the way, um, Jeff Illiff, who discovered the lymphatic system, and I had a conversation, and he said, I don't know if he's ever published this yet, if you impair the lymphatic system and put alpha-synuclein in a rat's brain, it spreads like wildfire. If you put it into a rat's brain with an intact lymphatic system, it stays there. And it will spread maybe a little bit. But there's de- he has said there's definitely a function in this in those pathologic proteins. Um, so these are great questions. I mean, they really are. And I think one of the, the really frightening things about this talk is they haven't been answered because amyloid sucked all the oxygen out of the room and all the money. And so there are many areas of this going on that we really haven't had research done because, honestly, people would tell you, there's actually a great article in Stat News, and it's called How a Small Cabal of Researchers Kept Us from Discovering a Cure for Alzheimer's Disease. And um, And in there, people said, you know, I went for an NIH grant, and I was told, get on the bandwagon or you'll never get another grant. You know, you were told, get, you're, you're unorthodox if you're not looking at amyloid. So it really just changes. So we have tons of questions that we really haven't answered, and we should. Okay, so, so there's been no funded research, but it sounds like you've been trying with some therapies. You told us about one patient. I, is, is that the only patient that you've done? What is, what's been the experience yeah. We've been treating mainly, we focused on dementia with Lewy bodies because dementia with Lewy bodies has the lowest acetylcholine in the brain of any disease. And we also just happen to have a lot of them in in our practice. This was actually 10 people. I mean, what the gap is, is the gap between what is your, the MMSE and what the MSE should be um, projected to be across um, 67 months. So this was a group of about 10 people. We actually have more, and we're actually putting that, um, that data together. But this is all clinical experience. We haven't been funded. Where's the hat? Where's the hat? Oh, um, the, um, um, we haven't had any funding on this. Uh, we were hoping when we actually licensed this to a drug company, we could actually have all sorts of experiments to do. But then we've had the, um, the crash in terms of nobody wants to fund drug companies. Actually, I remember a discussion when I was a, like an R2 and R3, and I was talking to this hematology fellow named Prad Fatok, and uh, he was telling me in the cafeteria, he said, do you know how hard it is to get going in a research project, to get your cell lines going, to get all this stuff and everything else? And it's the same thing. There is this lag time. There are whole careers in the 25 years that have been built on the amyloid hypothesis. And the um, whole departments funded, grad students did their postdoc in this. And it's going to take a while for that to clear out. So, if, if the well, you'll, you'll see if, if, you're, if you actually own any stock in Biogen, they're still trying to wring a success out of a drug that they, they threw in the trash can 18 months ago because they're trying to keep the stockholders on the hook. So you're right, absolutely. This, the, some of us have said the amyloid hypothesis died five years ago, and it's just been a zombie wandering around waiting for somebody to shoot it in the head. Um, and, but it still is, is pervasive all over the place. So the research has not shifted, and, the, and the, the, the wheels have not turned. I think they have to, and I think they will, because what a drug company looks at when they're looking at this, and uh, they'll say, wow, this is a phenomenal market. I mean, we have 5.8 million people with Alzheimer's disease in this country alone. 3030, 30, we're going to have, what is it, 30, 40, something? We're going to have 16 million people with Alzheimer's disease. Oh, and that's just Alzheimer's disease. 
We're not talking about dementia with Lewy bodies, which is the second most common, and uh, frontal temporal dementia. So throw them all in. A third of people over 85 have a cognitive impairment. So you're looking at a gigantic market, and, where, and they were willing to invest in that until 2018. And there were just so many failures, and they finally said, you know, we can't justify throwing stockholders' money down this rat hole when we have given them nothing in return. So we're in this phase where I think actually people have pulled back and they're looking to say, where should we put our money? I have my theory, <laughs> whatever I think they should put their money. But there are other people, the neuroinflammation people and the glucose, the glucose metabolism people um, are also you know, out there as hungry mouths to feed. So I think we'll see a change. Oh, do you? You ask a great question. Your your patients with overactive bladder, what do you treat them with? Um, two good, two great questions. And um, the first is, what can you do in terms of early onset Alzheimer's disease? Now, the key thing number one is if the person, um, if their relatives, if a family history with relatives having Alzheimer's disease before 65, and it looks like it's an early onset, then genetic testing for the amyloid precursor protein and the presenilin 1, presenilin 2 will actually tell them pretty much if they're going to get the disease. But that's rare. We're dealing with late onset Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, a lot of our diagnostic tests, if we flip back to those, uh, that really early slide I did here, the diagnostic tests, these biomarkers that are proposed, are also based on the amyloid hypothesis. So, come on. Um, if I was better with the computer, I'd be there. Okay. If you look at the biomarkers that are on the top here, you see that they, they, you can start to see where they start to occur. But many of these, again, are tau tau and amyloid base and they're not that good because people get amyloid in their brain i've had many amyloid positive people without um who ran off to the cleveland clinic and got um a um, amyloid scan which is currently not covered by insurance and so they dropped down five thousand dollars and they got this and came back and say i have alzheimer's and i say no you don't you don't have the symptoms you know because amyloid doesn't correlate Likewise, I have a patient I've been following for a long time. I don't think it's actually demented at all. I think he has ADD, but somebody did the CSF test on him and he came back with amyloid. So now they're telling me he has Alzheimer's disease. So they're not ready. I don't think the biomarkers are ready for prime time. And in the absence of having a defined therapy to do something, some people will say, is it justified to go in and give them this exact diagnosis if we can't do anything about it? I think we can. So I may differ with that. Second, do a second question, which is near and dear to my heart, because I actually spent, when I went into being a geriatrician, my major interest was urinary incontinence. How exciting is that? Um, but um, the, um, you know, and due to your referrals, really what has actually closed out my interest in urinary incontinence has been really what's a wave of dementia. And we're starting to see the early phase of what they call the gray wave or the gray tsunami. Um, but there are, if you look at the drugs that do not penetrate the central nervous system, the anticholinergics are the most effective drugs for, bladder, for overactive bladder. But if you look at the central nervous system di distribution of detrol, tolteridine, it's higher than cogentin, which you want to get in the brain. So they all accumulate in the brain, except for quaternary ammonium antimuscarinic drugs. And that's glycopyrrolate and trospium, Sanctura and Rubinol. These are excluded because they're ionized at body pH and they can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And, um, but they're a pain in the neck because you've got to take them on an empty stomach and some other things. But I, those are the only ones we'll use. Now, Mirabegron, um, which um, has come out, is a beta-3 receptor agonist that relaxes the muscles of the bladder. And that does not have, see, have anticholinergic effects. So I think that's reasonable. My problem with it is it just doesn't seem to work that well. Recently, they've approved it for combination with an anticholinergic, which may actually be more effective, but now you've got, now you got two drugs. Any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>